Um, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Emily Fagan and I'm the Acting Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association. And I'm very excited to bring you tonight's event, which is in partnership with Non-Religion in a Complex Future. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wissanic peoples, whose historic relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here, although I was not invited to do so. Um, and uh, just another quick note, uh, given tonight's turnout, everyone's mics have been muted. Um, you're gonna have the opportunity to ask questions to our uh, host, Peter, at the end of the event, at which point I'll unmute mics. And uh, yeah, you can feel free to throw your questions in the chat if you have them so that we can jump right into questions at the end of like the presentation or just hold on to them until that point arrives. Um, and we are also recording this talk, so it'll be available on our podcast at a later time. Um, so yeah, without uh, further ado, I would like to hand things off to uh, Peter Beyer, uh, who will be leading tonight's event. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm trying to cut the glare on my glasses, but it's not working. Um, I noticed that Marty Shoemaker there is doing a real good job of that. I don't know what you're doing right, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that there's a spy in our midst here. Uh, uh, Alicia Cummins is, is one of the people attending and uh, um, she and I work on this project together, right? Um, so um, I know um, that uh, uh, Emily asked at the beginning if any of our team members are gonna be here. I thought maybe not, but obviously there is one. Um, so um, there are quite a lot of us on this, on this research project. So it's not, really all that surprising that a, a few people should make it. Uh, anyway, uh, as I said, welcome. Um, uh, I'm gonna to try to um, talk about this research project that we're doing um, in a fairly comprehensible way, uh, but um, it's, uh, it's called uh, Non-Religion in a Complex Future. Uh, and I'd like to point out that the word complex is in there. Uh, which um, uh, is there for a reason, and as as um, as, as I will uh, demonstrate in uh, what I have to say about this. So um, I will I will use a PowerPoint slide just to you know so we, you all have something to follow along on. I know those some those things sometimes get in the way more than they help, but I'll I'll take the risk that, that that's not going to happen here. And so I will uh, put on my screen share. All right, if this is a, a multi-year uh, research project uh, on non-religion, um, and I'll have lots to say about what that might be. Um, and it's, uh, it's centered at, uh, at uh, my university, University of Ottawa. It's under the overall direction of Laurie Beeman uh, and my colleague, and uh, we're funded uh, about as generously as it gets in Canada uh, by the Social Sciences New Managed Research Council. Um, so uh, we, it's, as I'll explain, it's, it's a multi-year project, involves quite a lot of people, and it uh, involves seven different countries. Uh, and we have nine co-investigators. So it's, it's, it's not as large as some teams have been, uh, but uh, it's fairly large. And that's because we are trying to undertake this project in a very multi-pronged way. So let me start by uh, perhaps giving you an idea about why on earth are we doing this? Um, and uh, as much research um, is the case with much research, uh, this is uh, brought on by things that are happening in the world that um, we thought that it would be good to try to understand better. And one of the, the big symptoms, as it were, of this uh, changing happening in the world is what um, we generally refer to as the rise of the nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S, uh, which refers to the fact that in virtually every Western country, at least, um, the percentage of people who, when you ask them what their religion is, say none, uh, has in the last couple of decades, especially increased uh, significantly to the point where some countries um, like um, United Kingdom, for instance, that uh, depending how you point, ask the question, it's over 50% of the population. Uh, you folks, I imagine that virtually most of you are in British Columbia, and you probably know well that that's um, I, um, you know the, the, the land of the nuns, uh, where the percentage of the population that is of um, that kind of an identification 
uh, is 35% uh, overall and the Vancouver area, it's uh, over 50%. So um, that that's a pattern that's happening uh, across the, as I say, the Western world, um, including uh, notably in the United States where um, the percentage of people who claim no religious affiliation has gone from 15, 16% to about uh, over 20% within a decade. Um, so, you know, that what we used to know the United States as this uh, big exception where people are generally really quite religious, that that seems to be less and less the case and not just uh, uh, in Northwestern United States uh, in that other part of the territory that's often called Cascadia. So that's one aspect. So one of the things, what is going on here? And above all, I mean, who are these people, right? Um, who are the nuns? What are they doing? Um, uh, why did they get to be that way? Um, and what are they now? Uh, and uh, initially, of course, the only thing that we know about them is that what they're not, right? They say, when you ask them the religion question, they say, I don't have a religious identity. I don't uh, follow a religion or anything like that. Um, but what they do do um, is uh, not so much of a mystery, but it's a, a very, very complex situation because uh, we cannot assume, of course, that all those people who put that kind of an answer on a survey question um, uh, are, as it were, doing the same thing. The other thing that's, um, that's part of the background is that um, we seem to be living in a time worldwide where there is increasing uh, contestation and sometimes even conflict, conflict surrounding this difference between religion and, for Kenyan's sake, we call it, non-religion, um, various things like there are still a lot of countries in the world where uh, being an atheist, for instance, or a not religious person can be dangerous. Um, uh, there are places in the world where being a religious person can be relatively dangerous, uh, such as, for instance, in the People's Republic of China. Um, there are various areas of contestation in most countries, such as, for instance, Canada, um, you may uh, know about and remember what's been happening in Quebec lately with their um, their law that forbids people from covering their faces. Well, that was before COVID, obviously. Um, and uh, that they recently took the crucifix off the wall of the National Assembly. I mean, this is a contested, contested issue. Uh, and there are quite a lot of those things around. In the United States, it is still the case that uh, it may be the case that you can get elected dog get, get elected dog catcher now if you're an, an atheist or a professed atheist, uh, but uh, forget it if you want to be governor or, or let alone president. So there's still a very very different situation. Uh, in other parts, like in Latin America, it's um, the situation is really quite different. There there doesn't seem to be this phenomenon happening near to the same extent, and yet uh, it it is also there. On top of that, uh, most of the evidence that we have suggests that this trend that I've been talking about is likely to continue over the next little while because um, the research that the research has been done has shown that this has actually been going on for quite some time. And it's only very recently that we've noticed that this is an ongoing trend um, away from religious identification and on to whatever else that is. So that's the context. Now, um, this research project, um, I say it's complex, but uh, it's also um, tries to be relatively focused in what we're trying to do. So I've listed here, the these are the five things that we told the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council that we're going to do. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate mostly on the first two, which is why they're highlighted. And that is we're trying to develop new research tools to measure and describe non-religion, including trying to figure out what that is. Uh, and then the second one is to expand the conceptualization and theorizing of diversity to include non-religion, which indicates that uh, we're operating on the assumption that whatever non-religion is, it is itself really quite diverse uh, and cannot be, you know, the, the non-religion is, a, as I'll say later, it's 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 a it's a term that's a placeholder. You know, we need some kind of a word that we use to talk about what we're talking about. Uh, but it's uh, it it is really no uh, more than that. It doesn't really uh, have any particular content other than what it isn't. 
Now, our I should say that the project, um, uh, unfortunately, um, although it's a multi-year project and we've been going for about, well, it's getting close to two years now. Um, one thing that's happened, of course, is that COVID has got mightily gotten in the way of, uh, of trying to uh, carry out research. Um, uh, but the other thing too, is that we've had to spend quite a long time um, sitting down and figuring it out what it is that we're trying to do here um, and uh, figure out ways to do that. So um, the, to pursue those research questions that I introduced in the last slide, uh, we have some challenges that we've been facing and we've, we've been working on them, which is a way of saying is that we don't actually have any solid research results yet. Uh, so what I'm talking about today is what it is that we're trying to do uh, as opposed to what it is that we found doing it. Um, that will have to be for another time. So the challenges, uh, I've tried to outline them here. Um, what does it mean for a person, a society, a, a social institution to be non-religious? What does that mean? Right? We know what it doesn't mean, uh, or at least we think we do, um, but we don't know um, um, more than about that. Uh, second, another way of putting this, what is non-religion non -religion besides what it isn't, namely religion? Now, there are attempts to kind of get at this and sort of compare it and say, well, maybe people are doing a different kind of thing that's sort of religious, uh, call it an ersatz religion, a quasi-religion, a pseudo-religion. There's a whole literature on invisible religion, on implicit religion and things like that. So um, religion that isn't religion, but sort of resembles it, right? That's one uh, way that this uh, question um, has been answered in the past. Uh, and then we have a bunch of um, what I call them cognate terms. Um, uh, I'm sure you've all heard people who say I'm spiritual, but I'm not, not, but I'm not religious. Um, where the question is immediately, what does that mean, right? Um, and then people are willing to tell you and they have ways of expressing that, but that's one way of looking at it. People are moving towards more being more spiritual rather than being religious, whatever that means. Or um, there is this idea about cultural religion, um, that uh, people aren't religious anymore. They actually don't adhere to a religion, uh, but culturally they are maybe Muslim or Christian or, or, or Hindu or something like that, um, but not religiously. Again, the question begs itself, what, is, what exactly does that mean? Uh, then we, there's all other words we try to say, well, I don't want to use the word religion uh, because that's too specific, so I'll use something broader. Uh, and some of those things is worldview, um, a, world, a word that I've become very suspicious of because it doesn't really solve the problem anymore than calling it non-religion. And then we talk about identity, um, that's another word. And then this sometimes quite politicized word about values, you know, do they share our values? Um, is that what non-religion is all about? Um, a, a set of values? Well, so I put that in a question mark. All that to say that uh, non-religion is a placeholder. And one of the tasks that we've uh, been tackling in this project is to be um, really much more clear uh, or find out ways of being much more clear about what this non-religion is. Uh, uh, Laurie Beeman and I have, um, when we were a number of years ago talking about this project for the first time, we used um, the analogy of dark matter from physics, right? Uh, Non-religion is kind of like dark matter. Uh, it is a huge amount of what's out there, but it's difficult to see. Um, uh, and uh, therefore what we're looking for is something that is relatively difficult to see, at least using the tools that we've used thus far. So that's, um, uh, a way of looking at the challenges that the, uh, the research questions uh, uh, are facing. So how do we go about this? How do we identify what and who we're talking about? Uh, one of the ways that, uh, that, uh, that has come back again and again when you try to do this is that whatever non-religion is, you have to figure out how it's related to religion because that's the way you're identifying. It doesn't mean that non-religion is a kind of religion, uh, but there has to bear some relationship to it that can identify it as that, which it isn't, which is religion. Now, one of the problems behind that is that, um, and this has been going on for a long time, what's religion? Um, 
that's not an answer, a question that has a, uh, a, a very, very clear answer. Although uh, most of us go about in our lives having a pretty good idea about, you know, what we mean by religion. Um, uh, so, well, what's religion? Well, you know, it's what they do in churches and synagogues and, uh, you know, private prayer at home and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, so we have an idea what religion, but it's, you know, in order to figure out what non-religion is, uh, we would have to be actually a little bit more precise so that we can figure out what that relationship is. Now, uh, there are a bunch of labels out there which help us along our way. And one of them is, identifies um, your organization or the organization that is hosting this event. Uh, and that is uh, a, a non-religious person can be a humanist. Um, I don't think I have to throw into the mix as well, what exactly is that anyways? Uh, because I'm sure that um, um, the members of the association have had long discussions about that and will continue to do so. But there are others. Uh, atheists, I've mentioned a couple of times, um, uh, not all non-religious people are atheists, but some of them are. Um, there are people who call themselves free thinkers as a way of labeling themselves and giving us an idea of what this non-religion might be. There's that um, contested word secular, right? Uh, it's sort of like, what's secular? Well, it's not religious, right? But what is it really, right? Uh, agnostic is another one, rationalist is another, and I'm sure there are others as well. Um, all these things are understood to be, they are what they are, but they're also identified as being not religion, or at least not religious. And what we're after in this project is uh, precisely that positive content. Um, we don't, we don't want to know more about what this isn't, we want to know what it is. Um, and how it presents itself, what effect it has, et cetera. Um, we also get at this relation thing uh, in other kinds of ways, what I'm calling here, the sort of of the but nots, right? The, the, the one that I already mentioned, the one that is, is fairly common these days is the spiritual but not, or spiritual more than religious, There's the cultural religious one. And then there is the word, the idea of indifference um, ask people, so what about religion? Eh, I don't care. You know, I don't even think about that, right? Sort of that indifference. And then there's the marginals, right? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I guess, you know, I guess the family I grew up, up in, you could call it Christian or Jewish or something like that. But, uh, but you know, that's sort of a little minor part of my life and um, doesn't really occupy much of an important spot. So you got that sort of relationship that going on in there as well. So this is kind of the, this is all by kind of just to kind of set the context uh, of what it is that this research project is trying to go about. Now, let me tell you a little bit about, you know, the structure. Um, uh, obviously we, it, it's, it's, it's not only a large question, it's a question that can be addressed in on a whole bunch of ways uh, and in a whole bunch of places. Uh, it could also be addressed in a whole bunch of times, but we're not doing a lot of history in this particular project, although we could. So um, through, for practical reasons um, and others, uh, uh, the uh, research project is being carried out in seven different countries, or at least seven different regions, uh, Canada, Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Argentina, and we group the Nordic countries, the four Nordic countries all together. Uh, and that is the seventh site where this is taking place. Now you can see that um, uh, this group of countries is fairly selective because uh, we wanted to be careful that we had areas that were comp at least potentially comparable. Uh, it would have been very, very interesting, of course, to bring something like China or Korea or India into this. Uh, but the way thing, the way religion works in those parts of the world is so different that non-religion is going to be something rather different as well. And therefore you'd have to develop entirely different research tools and approaches in order to be able to study this question effectively there, but you could. So for practical purposes, we essentially have uh, narrowed it down to these Western countries, uh, but made sure to add in something that wasn't um, standard Western European, North American, Australasian, which is why we got Brazil and Argentina involved in this, and uh, you may well know Brazil and Argentina are really rather different places. 
Uh, so it's not just variations on theme, much like uh, Canada, Australia, and United States are really quite different places. Uh, in order to get a little bit of a handle on this, we've also uh, narrowed it down to what we call focal research areas uh, and places where we're going to look um, to study non-religion. Uh, and these are, as it's listed here, in the area of education, uh, in the area of migration, you know, non-religion and migration, um, uh, which is an important thing in Canada, the United States, Australia, and, and, and much of Europe. Um, health, uh, you know, in the larger sense of that word, um, the environment, uh, ecology, that kind of stuff, uh, and in the law. So it's, it's not that we, could have, we could have chosen different areas, but you know, for for practical reasons about where the expertise of the team lies and these kinds of things, uh, these are the ones that we chose. For instance, <clears throat> I have a, a relatively long history of uh, researching uh, religion and migration, so it's kind of natural to move over to non-religion and migration. Uh, my colleague Lori Beeman is a specialist in in law, and so that's a logical place for her. Uh, we have uh, people like Solange Lefebvre in, uh, in Montreal and Linda Woodhead in the UK who specialize in education, among other things, et cetera. So these are the, the areas. And I mention these is because uh, when I get, which is the, the, the bulk of the talk that I want to give here, when I get to the areas of describing some of the actual research that we're doing, uh, which I, you know, I hope that I can introduce some interesting factors there. Uh, that uh, they're going to concentrate on these uh, these five areas, or shall we say, be located in these areas, looking um, at researching non-religion in terms of these research areas. So, um, one of the challenges is uh, to actually translate these ideas and these questions into real research projects that generate usable information and knowledge, right? So um, some of the things we've th thought about or in, are in the process of doing uh, in the area of health. Uh, we're particularly interested in death and dying. So, I mean, I, I can't talk about all the projects. Um, there are quite a few of them. So we've got a project where we're trying to get at uh, the place of non-religion in palliative care. Um, uh, uh, many of you have had the experience, I know I have, of being in a situation where a loved one isn't palliative care and the atmosphere there is, you know, if you're in a hospital or in a hospice or something like that, all of a sudden religion is far more present than it would be in an ordinary hospital ward. Uh, and then in that particular situation, you might say, well, what, what do the non-religious people do? How, you know, how, how, are, they, how, are, how are they treated? Uh, what, what kind of services? Uh, and what needs do they have? How do they experience this? Um, and there are other kinds of areas that we're looking in there as well. In environment and, and health, we also have a number of projects going. I'm going to talk briefly about two of them. One is on trekking, hiking, walking, uh, and the other one is on community gardens. So I don't know if any of you are hikers. Uh, I know in BC that's uh, something that one does a lot. Um, and um, uh, maybe some of you are also involved in gardening. Um, and we're looking particularly at community gardens as opposed to, you know, the garden I have in my, my, my backyard and that you may have as well. So that's an area. Um, in the area of, of migration, we're looking at specifically non-religious migrants. Like, for instance, um, migrants who come to Canada, say, or refugees who come to Canada from Syria. Remember, we uh, not so long ago admitted somewhat 80,000 Syrian refugees. Um, and um, uh, most of those Syrian refugees are going to be have strong religious identities, uh, usually mostly Muslim, but a, a fair number of Christians as well. But then there's going to be the people who don't. So how do they make this experience of migrating as refugees to Canada when we know, for instance, that 75% of the sponsoring organizations uh, that help these refugees are in fact religious organizations or associated with religious uh, institutions. Um, how are these migrants, uh, you know, can you be a non-religious migrant in that kind of atmosphere? Uh, and, and what does that mean? Um, so that's what migrant reception means. So that there's another area where we're, we're, we're getting going on some interesting things. Um, uh, it's none of these things is as easy to research as one might think. Uh, so it often takes 
quite a long time to figure out exactly what to do uh, that has a hope of being um, successful um, rather than just doing it. And another thing we're, going to, we're doing is uh, we've created a survey with which we're trying, going to try to measure non-religion. And I'm going to be talking about uh, that a fair bit in the remaining time that I have, which I don't know what it is, um, uh, because that's the one that I'm in charge of. So I know most about it. So I figured I would talk about that. I'll talk a little bit about the trekking in Huni Gardens as an intro to some of the issues that we're facing. Uh, and then I'll spend, as I said, the remainder of my time talking about this survey to measure non-religion. And what I'm hoping is that, um, well, maybe I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of you will end up taking the survey, but uh, um, uh, we, sh we shall see. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the rationale, how we went about doing this, and introduce you to some sample questions of the kind of things that we think have some success of actually measuring this dark thing that we're calling non-religion. So um, I'm gonna have to move this. Okay. Two research projects, they're in the area of environment, but they kind of cross over into health as well. You know, it's, it's healthy to go hiking and trekking. It's healthy to eat uh, food that you grow yourself in your own community garden, et cetera. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of environmental issues involved there as well. So one of the ones, um, the people who are running this have entitled it Trekking Toward All, right? Non-religion and hiking. It examines how people understand the relationship to each other, nature and non-human animals uh, through hiking, trekking, walking, rambling as an entry point. So it's a way of trying to get at it. Uh, like other projects, um, it is designed, uh, and this is, this is actually very hard to do. It is designed to get away from like religion. Um, in other words, looking at these things as if they were religious substitutes or like religion. This is exactly what we want to get away from in order to try to understand um, these realities in our society, um, uh, perhaps with religion in, in the back of our minds, uh, but not as anything uh, that is actually religioid or religious. So that's that's the challenge. The project asks, what sort of experiences do people have while they are trekking? And how do they make sense of them? Um, do they even have such experiences? I mean, we're perfectly open for people saying, look, I just go and walk and I enjoy it, right? There's not much more to it. But others will, you know, probably tell us tales about, about you know, having uh, fantastic experiences that changed their lives or at least gradually reoriented their their uh, relationship to nature, to the world, to themselves, etc. How has trekking shaped what people actually do in terms of environmental behaviors? You know, has it made you more of an environmental activist? Um, does it reinforce uh, something that you're already involved in? Um, does it make you more aware of of, of the situation that we uh, that environmentally we are living in uh, in the world today? Does trekking change a person's outlook on what is important in life? Um, in other words, what effect does it have on people's actual behavior? Uh, and how does it make sense, uh, uh, help to make sense of the lives of the people who are engaged in it? Now, the methods that we're, that we're using, and I'm gonna have a lot to talk about, you know, how to actually change, translate these questions into actual research methods. Uh, that's a particular uh, challenging area. Um, the people who are doing this, uh, they have developed a survey. Right? We do that a lot, right? A survey where they can ask about attitudes, behaviors, experiences while trekking in the light of trekking. And they will undoubtedly also go to clubs that do trekking and interview people and maybe do some participant observation to see what goes on. Um, especially since, um, unsurprisingly, we have about, um, we have at least three people on the team of nine co-investigators who are avid hikers. Um, and uh, we'll regularly say, no, I can't come to that meeting because I'm uh, trying to climb a mountain. So the American fellow we have on here, uh, he is, I think he's almost done. He has climbed to the highest point in every state of the union. I don't think he's quite made Mount McKinley yet. Um, that would be the biggest challenge. Um, but uh, I think he's he's done 
Washington and Oregon and, uh, you know, the ones with the big peaks, um, I think, but he's working on it, right? Uh, but I should also say he's, he's really quite a young man. So uh, he's, uh, he's, he's physically able to do this. And we have the fellow down in Tasmania. He's also, he's, a, he's begged off meetings saying, sorry, I'm going to go be hiking there. And our uh, co in, uh, in in Norway, uh, she's, you know, she's all over the place. Jordan, Central Asia, um, you know, um, Northern Africa, you know, going on bicycle trips and, you know, trekking through the wilderness and, and, and through, through all sorts of territory. So it's something that, uh, that a lot of us can relate to directly. Uh, and I should say also say that um, uh, I would say that a disproportionately large number of the people who are on this research are themselves non-religious. So, um, you know, it's kind of, there's a bit of an insider thing going on here as well, but not all of us, you know, there we have some quite uh, honestly religious people on the team as well, quite a few of them in fact. Now, um, the other one, community gardens, Choose these pictures again. Um, here, the purpose is to explore the social and ecological relationships created by community gardens. That's what it's a community thing. One of the things that we're really focused in on is how um, you know how whatever non-religion is manifests itself in people's social relationships. That's you know through so the idea of community, um, um, and uh, and this is one particular one that starts right there by looking at that aspect of social relationship and how people relate to one another in these particular contexts here in the context of community gardens. How do people link their gardening to how they think about and interact with nature? Again, it's similar to the trekking. Um, here we, um, they, you know, I know they are thinking of a, an, a survey, but uh, this is going to be mostly kind of uh, going to gardens and talking to the people who are involved in them, uh, interview with key stakeholders um, uh, and asking people who are actually involved and maybe getting involved oneself and seeing what actually goes on here. Uh, so, you know, the questions are, what role does nature play in shaping these relationships? Um, where do the gardens come from? What is their history? Uh, what are the kind of relationships have established that? Do they have relationships with other institutions like religious institutions, food banks, municipal authorities, et cetera? Um, and at the moment, this project is um, still trying to figure out which gardens they're going to do in which countries. Apparently, it's not as simple as it seems. Uh, there isn't just community gardens. There's a whole variety of them, and they take all sorts of shapes, sizes, and structures. And so um, uh, we're having to do a fair amount of work to make sure that we get it right and that we uh, get a representative sample of such gardens in the various countries that we're doing this in. So there's a lot of organization planning that has to get done. And the community garden ones is uh, still at that stage. So as I say, it's currently trying to finalize and pick the gardens. So that's uh, a couple of projects that are different than the one I'm gonna talk about mostly, which is the, um, the measuring non-religion survey. Again here, what we're trying to do is do it positively, not what it isn't, but what it is. Um, uh, what is its content? So uh, they say a non-religious person can tell you that they're not religious. Uh, but then you want to say, well, you're not religious. Well, what do you do? How do you run your life? Um, how do you view the world? Um, how do you do your non-religion? When you try to translate this into a survey, you have an immediate problem is as well, what questions are you going to ask people? other than, you know, are you religious or not? We're certainly gonna do that, but we don't wanna ask them positive questions. So um, um, the way we've tried to do this is to pick areas where we might find interesting things. And we've used the uh, four research focal areas or the five research focal areas to try, help to try to structure that. So um, uh, we have a, a number of uh, approaches here. One is we want to measure value orientations, a kind of a really broad term, um, uh, which I will give you some examples of. But, uh, you know, it sort of uh, it measures the degree. Well, one of the things it measures is the degree to which you're non-religious. Right. But uh, uh, much more thing, uh, things like, for instance, as the second line, what's your what's your ethical perspective? You know, what's your morality? Uh, where does it come from? Um, how do you perceive that? How do you live that? Right. Um, 
again, the questions of social relationships. Um, um, in in the literature on on religion, there's a there's a whole lot of stuff on how religion provides network, community, a place to to identify, a place to be. And so we said, well, non-religious people aren't going to have that. Um, they're going to have something else. So uh, we're, we're we're thinking, well, maybe maybe it's community gardens, maybe it's trekking, maybe it's the BC Humanist Association, maybe it's a whole bunch of other stuff. But we want to try to find out. Then we have the particular questions that, that we've tried to devise with the five different areas in mind, namely environment, migration, law, health, and education. What kind of questions can we ask in relationship to that to try to get at the positive content of whatever this might be? Certainly, we're going to have to ask questions about the people's attitude towards religion, because that's also part of it. Um, uh, it's not the main thing we're after, but we, you want to say, how do you relate to religion? positively or negatively. And of course, we have to ask the demographic questions, age, uh, um, gender, sex, um, uh, socioeconomic status, all, you know, education, all these kinds of things. Uh, and then there's a very particular sort of questions is that the, what we call the sorting questions. Are we going to classify people as religious or non-religious in terms of this survey? Uh, and interestingly enough, those questions are actually going to be at the end. Um, because, you know, we're not mainly interested in that. We're interested in uh, people's, the way people put their, their selves together um, uh, in various areas of their life. Okay, considerations in formulating the questions. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do these questions, oops, how do these questions measure non-religion considering that we don't quite know what that is. Now, uh, um, we've adopted two conceptual strategies, which you might call tricks to try to get it. One is to take a page from religion, but to not use religion to do it. In, uh, in religious studies, which is the discipline that um, I've spent most of my academic career in, sociology is the other one, um, we often talk about the components of religion as the four C's, code, cult, community, and creed. Code is ethical code, cult is the ritual, community is the collective part, and creed is what people believe. So, you know, Christians believe that Jesus is God, uh, they go to church, um, they uh, attend mass or whatever, the, or read their Bible, uh, and uh, they have a strong sense of what their religion tells them is right and wrong, okay? So uh, the idea is the non-religion would have parallels to these dimensions. So moral and ethical orientations that are non-religious, behaviors uh, which, are, uh, which express the non-religion, uh, but they're not necessarily rituals. They could be, but um, they, they might be. Senses of belonging and relationships, they would be there as well. And of course, this broad area of attitudes and values. So that's one way of looking at it, a kind of components that we're looking for. However, all this without religious assumptions, like looking for a substitute for transcendent sacrality, uh, or what I like to call nine biolo non biological actors, God, spirits, ghosts, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's, that's sort of excluded from the scene uh, because otherwise that would. Uh, suck us back into the religion vortex. Uh, the other idea is to look at whatever non-religion is as um, a personal or a collective, uh, one way of putting it is a system of life regulation. How do you run your life? Um, or what is your worldview? What is your identity? Worldview and identity are two words that try to get at that same kind of idea. Who am I? What should I do? And with whom? What is it good? What is it good to strive for? What it is? What is it uh, good to avoid? What is it? What is bad? Uh, with whom do I associate? Why? Uh, why is that important? Uh, and what does that make of me as a human being? All those questions uh, are, you know, try to assume under assume under this this idea of life regulation. Uh, in other words, uh, worldview or identity. Okay, now. That's to give you kind of the background. 
Um, now, keep an eye on the time here. Yes, it's about right. Um, so here are some, this is to give you an idea of the actual questions we're gonna ask. So this is sort of saying, how did we end up actually translating all this abstract stuff I've been talking about into real questions? And then what I'm hoping is that you guys can um, look at these questions and ask yourselves, um, how would I answer that? Does the, is the answer important, right? Uh, for who I am, right? As um, a, relig a non-religious or, you know, if the case may be a religious person. So uh, we have sorting questions and we do this a number of ways. We don't just say, uh, what is your religion? And you say none, you're in. That's one of the ways we do it. Uh, but we do it other ways too. For instance, uh, we ask people, how religious do you think you are? Just your subjective opinion, right? Uh, whatever you mean by that, uh, where do you fit? And then we have the typical kind of, you know, five scale answer, uh, not at all religious, all the way to very religious with uh, three options in between. Uh, and then of course, what you do is you take that identification and then correlate it with the answers to the other questions to figure out who the non-religious uh, are. Another way is to do it much more, more positively, uh, and that is to look at these uh, alternatives that I mentioned before. Um, uh, you know, the list is, is, can be larger than this, but we decided on these six to try to get at it. You know, do you consider yourself to be an atheist, an agnostic, a humanist, a free thinker, a rationalist, or simply just not religious? And of course, this one has check all that apply because people can be more than one thing. So those are a couple of questions we have about we have the one about, you know, what's your religion, right? That that one's there too. But there are about three or four of these things to try to sort out uh, who are going to count as non-religious people in terms of this survey. Then we have, as I said, the attitude toward religion ones. Um, uh, and these are basically questions for people who, um, uh, who are non-religious, right? So you know, we wouldn't ask this um, uh, for people who say they're religious, because as you can say by the, uh, see by the, well, the second one, you know, you might have some religious people who think this way, but uh, generally not. So uh, a lot of these questions are on this, on this scale thing from strongly disagree to strongly, dis, uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And I'm sure all of us have done lots of these surveys asking these kinds of questions using these scales. And as always the cop, you know, the opt out answers, is, I don't know, I can't choose among them, right? So uh, most of the questions that I'll present to you are actually of this type. Um, do you agree with the statement, right? Uh, yes or no. Um, then so we have, religion is good for those who believe in it, but it's not for me. Well, we'll see. Uh, that's almost a sorting question, but it's, uh, you know, it's also an attitude question. Uh, religion is bad and only leads to violent hatred, prejudice, and delusion. Now, we're not assuming that non-religious people are gonna answer strongly agree with this one. Um, they may well not, but we do want to know how they relate to this kind of a question. So those are attitude to religion. There's, there's, there's about, in each one of these things, there are uh, from three to five questions that try to measure a particular sub area. Uh, and there are about five of these things. Education sample questions. Again, from strongly disagree to strongly agree, um, students in public schools should learn about a wide range of religions and other non-religious worldviews. Do you agree or not? I think the public school curriculum should promote a secular scientific worldview. Yeah, another attitudinal kind of thing. Now, one of the um, things that I should mention is we've tried to construct this survey so that we might possibly find non-religion among religious people, right? It's not excluded. Um, so there's an awful lot of these questions that we will ask anybody whether they've identified as relig religious or not, because we want to know what what uh, uh, what their orientation is, their you know their tendency towards behaviors on, on all these kinds of issues, and then try to relate that to um, their degree of uh, religiousness or not. Value orientate. Now, there's lots of these. That's why I've given three because there's uh, there's a there's a whole there's a bunch of scales actually that we're using that we've uh, taken from the social psychologists. Um, uh, but um, here I've just um, picked a few to give you a kind of a, a little taste of 
the kind of stuff where I, I should say there are the, the questionnaire we have at the right right now has 95 questions. Um, and um, we've had test pre tested and it take apparently takes 25 minutes to do this thing right so it's not too uh, demanding, but still fairly amount fair amount of time so. Uh, there are things that cannot be grasped by the natural sciences. Uh, that's kind of an orientation towards uh, uh, the natural sciences, uh, towards you know how understandable life is, etc. Um, another one would be: I would accept limitations to my standard of living if it alleviated other people's suffering. This is the caring dimension, right? Um, and uh, here we, this one is an example of a behavioral question: people, what's something people uh, do or would do in this particular case? Uh, and then this kind of um, sense of belonging into in in the world, uh, with a question that is, I feel part of a bigger whole. And here, I mean, as I say, ask yourself. I mean, how would I know how I would answer these kinds of questions? Um, how would you answer one of these questions? And uh, uh, what do you think that might tell researchers such as myself uh, about about you? Morals and ethics sam sample questions. Well, here uh, we've got. We don't have too many of these, but these are scenario questions. So, you know, you get kind of tired of these uh, scale answers, right? So every now and again, we throw in a question that has got a bit more substance to that, right? So um, uh, I'll just, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to read these questions rather than me reading them out. Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I use Charles as, a, as an example because he, I could tell what he was reading. So that when he's finished, then uh, I'm using that as the, um, as the measure. So you see, we, we've given you kind of a scenario and then um, um, it's sort of like, um, what's your attitude towards the decision of these people uh, in these scenarios and um, what, what do you think they, they should do, right? So it's, these are kind of moral and ethical question examples. Social relationship ones are, again, you know, the scales make it relatively straightforward. Um, and um, uh, here, these particular social relationship questions ask about um, the importance of family and friends. How important are these relationships? And, you know, to what degree would you, uh, are you engaged with them? Uh, so as in the second question, I will go out of my way to be there for family and friends, right? Um, so it's not just that, you know, their family and friends, you get together with them every now and again. Uh, it's, it's more than that. You actually have a sort of a commitment uh, to help them when they're in need, et cetera. Environmental samples. So here's a behavioral one. I'm willing to accept cuts to my standard of living in order to protect the environment, right? Um, that's a, it's a value orientation, but it's also like a, 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 you know, an ability to measure the degree of people's behavior, at least their, their potential behavior, uh, should it come to that. Uh, and then, you know, a kind of a standard question about global warming and climate change. Um, you know, do you think it's a problem? Um, how concerned are you? Uh, there, as I said, there are more questions in each of these subgroups, but these are a couple of samples. Law ones. 
Um, this actually uh, uh, does a, a, a um, kind of a, a, a take on on the crucifix in the, on the wall of the National Assembly, asking people if they are, find it acceptable that religious images and symbols be displayed in public buildings, such as schools, municipal council chambers, and legislative assemblies. Um, uh, what's your attitude to that? Do you agree with that uh, or you don't? And then uh, one that's almost a flip side of that is, I think religious communities should have the right to rule on matters pertaining to family law outside of the state's legal system. Um, uh, I know that um, in Ontario back in 2007, we had, I think it was 2007, we had an incident um, where uh, about, um, it was called um, faith-based arbitration, right? Uh, Ontario had passed a law in 1991, basically allowing people to undergo uh, arbitration, you know, uh, with an arbiter uh, using religious law as a basis, as long as they all agreed to do that, right? Uh, and then around 9, 2007, um, um, somebody found out about it, shall we say, to make it simple. Uh, and then it was a big public issue. And to make a long story short, uh, the government of the time absolutely squashed this possibility, um, saying, no, this can't happen. So, um, you know, we asked the question, well, what's your attitude towards that kind of a question? Then the migration ones. Um, this, these ones um, are the first two uh, are questions that we'd only ask of people who have migrated or whose families have migrated relatively recently. Uh, if you of your parents are non-religious, was it easier to be open about this in your country of origin or in Canada? Right. So if you, for instance, uh, an, an atheist from Pakistan, right, is it easier being an atheist here or was it easier in Pakistan? Right. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then the second one uh, in Canada, obviously, depending on what country this is in, it would be changed. People make assumptions about my religiosity based on my name, country of origin or appearance, whether I'm religious or not. So that's that question about um, do non-religious people get received in particular kinds of ways uh, when they come into the country? And then a question for everybody. And here we've tried to be um, pretty kind of, you know, really punch right at it. Uh, and what he says is, I think we should limit newcomers coming from Muslim countries. Well, what do you think about that, right? Uh, and so it's, it's not a question about what do you think about immigration policy and stuff like that. It's one that gets directly at, at you know, what it often is really all about. It's about Muslims. Um, so those are the migration questions. And the last ones, I think this is the last uh, uh, um, thing, uh, slide, health sample questions. So uh, again, uh, just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of the variety and the kinds of questions we're asking, uh, my health is mostly determined by my own behavior and chosen lifestyle. In other words, your health is under your largely under your control, and you can do something about it. Uh, and secondly, um, a question that I particularly find interesting is uh, people's attitude towards, attitudes towards GMOs. Uh, genetically modified foods are very dangerous developments and should be stopped. What's your attitude towards that? Um, that is a question that, uh, one of those questions that really, as, as well as any other, crosses the religion, non-religion divide in interesting ways. And uh, we would be interested in finding out what the pattern of answers is to a, a question like that. Okay, that's it. I think I've said enough. Uh, I was supposed I was trying to try to do this in 45 minutes. And I went a little bit over, uh, but not too much. So why don't I just stop there and um, give you guys a chance to talk. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate such like a in-depth presentation on this. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed this talk. It's the last talk in our spring series because uh, I am leaving the BCHA at the end of next week. Um, so I hope you guys all enjoyed. And if you want to see future talks, um, definitely email myself or uh, Ian when he comes back from paternity leave at the end of next week with um, what you would like to see in the future. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight.